Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to look at this chapter. It's not a very long chapter. It's only 21 verses. But there are still some key highlights that we'll want to look at and notice uh, as well. Um, I'm calling this Daniel's vision of a man, King Cyrus, and Michael. Those are going to be kind of the, the key themes in this chapter that we'll look at. And by way of saying that, let's just review a little bit. If you were here last time, in fact, I think I have some quiz questions. That reminds me. You would feel cheated if you didn't have a quiz, right? Uh, let's see, where did I put those questions? Um, let's see, okay, here we go. Now, Daniel mentioned in chapter 9, which we saw last week, that he himself was reading and studying another prophet, the writings that God had given to another prophet. Who was that prophet? Jeremiah. You don't even need choices. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Zechariah, or Jeremiah. It was Jeremiah. And then we find from that that even though a prophet might get special revelations from God, that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that there's not more for them to study that God has given to other prophets and that any one single just being a prophet doesn't mean you know all of the entire will of God. God's message and will is so great that no one person really can explain and understand all of it. Uh, I mean, we are to understand as much as we can in our own human uh, capabilities. But Daniel, although had been given special revelations from God, he is studying another prophet. Um, all right, let's see. Next question. Uh, that's kind of a tough one. These, some of these are multiple choice, and without me reading all the, the choices, they're going to be kind of difficult. Well, in Scripture, where do we find the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? This was a key, uh, key event that was going to mark the starting point for the 70-week prophecy. What book of the Bible? Ezra. All right, I heard it. All right, is it Ezra? Ezra, uh, chapter 7 specifically, gives us a, an exact recording of the decree Given by, in fact, that's another question. Uh, I'll get to that question in a second. Well, I'm just going to ask it. Who was the king that issued the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem? Artaxerxes. All right, it's Artaxerxes uh, of Persia. Artaxerxes the first. Uh, that was actually a bonus question, so bonus points for Elder Prest. Now, uh, next question. This is a regular, no bonus for this, just regular credit. What event marks the end of the 70-week prophecy or the 490 years that were especially given to the Jews? The stoning of Stephen is correct. Uh, that event, when Stephen was stoned, the first Christian martyr shows the Jewish nation by their leadership, the Sanhedrin, they rejected the Christian, they rejected Jesus by having him crucified, but then even after Jesus was crucified, for another three and a half years, Jesus sent a message of forgiveness and repentance to the nation of Israel. And they sealed even a second call to repentance and forgiveness by stoning the apostles and disciples that were sent to offer the forgiveness. And they just plugged their ears and gnashed their teeth at Stephen and rushed at him. And st That marks the end of the time period in which... Uh, and I put this chart up here just to kind of look at and, and overview a few things that we saw. The time that was especially allocated in Daniel chapter 9, that 70-week prophecy that was especially for the Jewish nation. And... I hope it's, it's clear, I, I'm not anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish in any way, but because of this prophecy that God gave back long ago, it shows that although they were given a time of probation, the Jewish literal nation of Israel is no longer God's chosen people to be His messengers to give the message that He intends for them to give to the world. Uh, the, the church today, or Israel today, in the New Testament, Paul describes it as spiritual Israel. And I think at the, I was kind of in a rush at the end of our last session talking about in Galatians where it says, um, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, that have faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And so Abraham, that's what the Jews, when you read in the New Testament, they're claimed to be, we're descendants of Abraham and we're never in bondage to any man. John chapter 8. We are, we're Abraham's children. We, we're, we're assured a place in the kingdom of heaven because of our DNA. But Jesus was trying to help them to understand that DNA does not get anybody into heaven. It is the quality and the character of faith of Abraham that is what matters. And so his true descendants, they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And so they which are of faith, what is faith? It's believing and trusting and depending upon the word of God. When you just take the word of God and say, whatever God says, I believe it. I believe it and I'm going to trust it and act upon it. No matter what I see around me that looks like it's not going to happen to what God says... I'm going to trust God.
That's the same quality of faith that Abraham had. And so the same which have the faith of Abraham, that's his true descendants in a spiritual sense because it's the spiritual qualities of Abraham that are most important, that are what uh, God cares about. We can't control our, our lineage. We can't control our heritage. I'm, I'm the result of a teenage pregnancy. My mom was 15 when, uh, when I was born. My dad was 16. They were sophomores in high school. I had nothing to do with that. I had no control over that. But, yep, here I, here I am. And so... I can't control that, but what I can choose and have a part in play is I can, I can decide whether I want to have faith and trust in what God says, the same way that Abraham did. Amen. So, anyway, all right. So we saw here, and in this Daniel chapter, I'm going to stand on a chair. It makes me feel better when I can point right at something. Even if I have a laser pointer, I like to get right down to it. This was this Daniel 9 was important because it helped us put together and understand the starting point for this longer prophecy here, which is called the 2300 day prophecy, but because they are prophetic days, that means they are 2300 literal years. And it finally gave us a starting point, and we see that the 70 week prophecy and the 2300 day prophecy, they start at the same time. They have the exact same starting point, which is this command that was given by the angel Gabriel to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, when there is a command that is given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. From that point, he says that's when it's going to mark, uh, mark the beginning of the 2300-day the prophecy. And so what I didn't talk about in our last time together is you, you, what is the significance of this ending point here? That's what I guess I don't need to stand in a chair. It's right here. When you come down to 2300 days, this is way back in the past. That's so far back. That's way back in antiquity. But when you fast forward or put the prophecy into effect, you come all the way down here to 1844, uh, you're getting within just 200, less than 200 years from the time we're living in today. Something was going to happen, and it was talked about in Daniel chapter 8 as the cleansing of the sanctuary. Um, but we couldn't determine when this was going to be, this cleansing of the sanctuary, until we knew the starting point for when to put this 2300 day prophecy in, in effect. We just had a block of time in Daniel 8, because remember at the end of Daniel 8, he got sick, physically sick, and he couldn't hear the rest of the message of the explanation that Gabriel had intended to give to him. And so Gabriel gives him over 10 years to recover, and, and in Daniel 9, Daniel is prayed, and then Gabriel comes back and, and gives him the, the details so that he could know when to, went the wrong way, when to start this prophecy. Well, here's another slide that I handed out, and I don't know if everyone got a copy of this uh, last time. Did everyone get a copy uh, of this uh, chart? If you did not, I have a few extra copies. Uh, if you didn't get a copy of that, so you can see and look at it uh, on your own. There's a lot of information here, but I'll just say this. The same organization that put together these study guides, Amazing Facts, is the same one who put together this chart and this website, Bible Prophecy Truth. It is the same organization. And I spent four months there in their school training and studying together, and I can assure you that they are not just putting crazy, strange, random things together. It is biblically solid. It is entirely based on a clear and proper interpretation of the Scriptures, in my opinion. So anyway, there, there is a connection here with this explanation of what this is referring to and this cleansing of the sanctuary. Well, I want to come down and, and look next at what is this idea of the cleansing of the sanctuary. And, and Fred, would you pass out, I, I put together a handout, or just a, a one sheet of paper, that has a, a short Bible study on one page that is going over the question that is called, you know, what is the cleansing of the sanctuary, which is supposed to happen at the end of, and I'll go back to my... It was supposed to happen and start in 1844, which is much closer to our day than these events happening way back here. Not that these are not important with giving us the time and date for Jesus' baptism and his death on the cross and, of course, the end of the Jewish probation in AD 34. But as it comes down to this cleansing of the sanctuary, what is that? Uh, what, what is that all about? And so I want to take just a little bit of time uh, with this handout and try to go over that. I'm going to have this uh, model up here to kind of look at uh, together. What is, move this out of the way because I'll trip over it. This is a, this is a serious, um, very sobering message that God has given to us that although it was given long ago, over 2,000 years ago, 2,500 years ago, the message, it actually becomes present truth or a reality 
since the time of 1844. And so it's, it's very, very significant. It concerns every person living on the earth at this time. Do I have enough copies, Fred? I hope I did. I made 40 copies and I might have... Uh, might not have... All right, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take one myself. That's all right. I, I think we have enough. He still has some more in his hands, so I think we have enough so that... Well, so the, the question then, what is the cleansing of the sanctuary? And let's just look at... These are just some Bible verses that we'll, we'll kind of just look over, skim over quickly, and then we'll go, go into our study of Daniel 10, because this is a key point. This is a huge event that literally, according to what the Bible says, is happening right now. It's actually in process right now. So let's see that. The first scripture at the top of your sheet says Daniel 8.14. And we saw this two weeks ago. This is a key verse in the entire Bible, according to my, my opinion, because it relates to this longest time prophecy and this special event that would happen at the end of the 2300 days. And Daniel heard, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And so I tried to put a few little comments or notes in here to just help jog your, your thinking uh, about what this is referring to. And the note says, after 2,300 days, and I made a typo here, it should not say prophetic years, it should say prophetic days. So if you're taking notes and you want to just scratch out years, I, did, I noticed that after I printed it out. I went back and changed it in my notes, but I didn't change it on your handout. It should say prophetic days is equal to literal years. Not prophetic years is equal to literal years. Prophetic days, 2,300 prophetic days, are equal to 2,300 literal years. There is, at this time point, if I were to go back to the, uh, the chart again, at this time point in 1844, there is no sanctuary that exists on earth. And Daniel, was, when he's given the prophecy way back here, the, there was a sanctuary, it was in ruins in Jerusalem, uh, and it was actually going to be rebuilt. In fact, the first part of the prophecy there, which I didn't go over in our last time in Daniel 9, because there's already so much information, but it says it would, re, it would be rebuilt in 49 years. Seven sevens, or 49 years, the temple would be rebuilt. But that's just a small piece. But after the time of this whole prophecy comes to an end, there's, there's literally no temple or sanctuary that exists any, on earth. There, there's none. The sanctuary that did exist was actually destroyed by the Romans, I'll put it right about in here, in A.D. 70, uh, when the uh, Roman general Titus came and destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple down and, and just raised it to the ground. It has not been rebuilt since then. And so therefore, if you look in the note where it says, because there is no sanctuary that exists on earth, this sanctuary that this prophecy is referring to when it says after 2,300 days or years, the sanctuary will be cleansed, it must point to the sanctuary that exists in heaven. And many people, that's a new thought to them, but the idea that there's a sanctuary in heaven, I have references there. I won't, for the sake of time, look at all of those. Exodus 25, verse 40, the Lord told Moses to make the sanctuary on earth, which is this one right here. Um, this one, he said, make it after the pattern that I will show you in the mount. And that pattern is the true sanctuary that exists in heaven. And then if you uh, look at Hebrews 8, uh, the first five verses, it talks about now all the things which we have spoken. This is the psalm. We have such an high priest who is set down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, which the Lord pitched or set up and not man, that Jesus in heaven right now is seated at the right hand of God in the sanctuary that exists in heaven, which the Lord pitched, pitched it not through it, but pitched it in that he set it up, and not man, it was not built or set up by any person. And also in Hebrews 9, it talks about the same language. Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 9 are huge chapters that make clear there is a sanctuary that exists in heaven. And so, continuing on with our next verse, Daniel 7, we're going to find that the event mentioned in Daniel 7 and the event in Daniel 8 are referring to the same thing with just a different description. The same event... Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, you might recall these verses. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Oh, that's a typo there. Days should be capitalized, because it refers to a proper noun as God the Father. That's my mistake. If I were to go back, and I would not. Ancient of Days is God the Father, and then it goes on and describes how his throne was like the fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire, and then verse 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him, Thousands and thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And here, underlined, is the key part 
The judgment was set and the books were opened. And so the note says the cleansing of the sanctuary and the judgment are what? It is the same event. If you were to recall, and I know this has been a ton of information for those of you that have never heard this before. In Daniel 7, when we had the four beasts that came up out of the sea, and then the ten horns on the fourth beast, and the one little horn that came up that was with the mouth speaking boastfully and, and was thinking to change God's times and laws, the very next event after that little horn is speaking boastfully and, and would reign and rule for a time, times, dividing times, the very next event, it suddenly has this picture in verses 9 and 10 of the judgment. In the sequence of times, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then it was pagan Rome, the Roman Empire, and then papal Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, and then judgment, that picture of the judgment. And then if you go to Daniel 8, it was, remember the, the ram and the he-goat, it's had Medo-Persia with the ram with the two horns, then it had the goat, the he-goat, which was Greece with the notable horn, and then four horns came up. And then among those four horns, another little horn came up, which at first was waging war on a horizontal level, which represented pagan Rome or the Roman Empire. And then it started waging warfare on a vertical level, which is papal Rome. And then all of a sudden it goes into verses 13 to 14 and it says, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And I went through a lot of information there just to show you that as we look at those historical markers, those events and kingdoms, the events of where these line up with the judgment in Daniel 7, verses 9 and 10, and the cleansing of the sanctuary, they fall on the same location at the same sequence of the events that come up before them. If, if that makes sense. So you can, you can show or see that they're connected logically by the order in which they follow in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. Now, uh, let's continue on. 1 Peter 4, verse 17. Now, this is a verse you might not have read before. It says, For the time has come, the judgment must begin where? That's a serious statement. The Bible, I did not make that up. That's what the Bible says. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, or the house of God would be the church. God's people, God's people that have professed to be followers of Him. Judgment begins, according to the Bible, with the house of God. And so what I'm, trying, what I'm saying then is this description of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the judgment that was set represents a judgment and cleansing of the people of God. And you can also, if you want to put another note in here, uh, put down beside this in 1 Peter 4, 17, write Ezekiel 9, 4, and 5. Ezekiel 9, 4, and 5 is a picture in the Old Testament where it talks about um, God said, uh, he sent a messenger and said, go through the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst of the land. But set a mark, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. And set a mark, a mark of some kind of an indication that these are God's people that are sighing and crying for all the sins and abominations taking place in the land. And so we see in that picture there's judgment that's given, but it begins with, first of all, the house of God. Not the wicked. The judgment of the wicked, when we study Revelation in Revelation chapter 20, the judgment of the wicked, all the wicked takes place during the millennium. And you don't have to believe it now. I'll show it to you when we study that. But it's only the judgment of any of those who ever claimed and professed to be a Christian who are actually being examined in this time. If I never take the name of Jesus, if I just turn my back and I've never in my life ever claimed to be a Christian, well, I'll just keep my sins. I'll keep all my iniquities to myself because I've never claimed to profess to accept Jesus and accept his sacrifice in my life. And so if I claim to accept that, then there's an examination that's done over all the books of record, which the Bible describes, as you know, I've talked about before, there's three different types of books in the Bible. Uh, I think I have that on here, don't I? Uh, tell me I put that on here. There's books of records, which are the records of all the sins of, human, of, of mankind. There's a book of life. And there's also a book of remembrance, which records all the good deeds and the positive things that a person has ever done to, uh, to follow God. So there's three different kinds of books that the Bible refers to. And it's those books that are being referred to, if you're looking at the second where the second uh, paragraph there, where it says Daniel 7, 9, and 10, where it says um, the judgment was set and the what was opened. Mm -hmm. The books were opened. And so those books then, the records are actually in the sanctuary, because in this Old Testament service, we saw that in a sanctuary every day, remember a, a person would come in and they would offer their sin offering at the, the altar of sacrifice, and then the blood was actually taken from the animal and it was transferred into the sanctuary and sprinkled before the veil of the most holy place, which is where the Ark and the Covenant, I mean, God's law is. 
Sin is de defined in 1 John 3, 4 as the transgression of the law. That is the simplest and the only definition for sin. So when it talks about Lucifer sinned in heaven, he violated and broke God's law. That is the definition, biblical definition for sin. Sometimes people make the, the defining sin very squishy and, and unclear. The Bible is not unclear about what's right and what's wrong. Sin is defined biblically as transgressing the law of God. And so when blood is brought in here and sprinkled before the Ark of the Covenant, which is where the law of God is, it's showing that the sinner is, is sorrowful and is presenting a, a sacrifice which God asked him to bring to demonstrate their repentance and sorrow for sin and their desire to be forgiven. And so there is the transfer that by, by the transferring of the blood, a record of the sins. If I, so we'll, just, we'll just use me as an example. Say I, I did something terrible. I, I told a lie about Frank or I did something mean to my wife or something. And I realized I should not have done that. I bring in a sin offering, an animal. I'm the one. The priest helps me. I kill the animal. I'm the one who put my, I put my hands over it, confess my sins over it. I'm the one who made the mistake. I'm not making all this stuff up, by the way. I know this sounds complicated, but this is divine wisdom in the process of how horrible sin is and the process to remove it from us. There is still, although when I bring my hand, I put my hands on the, the, the sacrifice and I kill the animal, yes, I, I'm forgiven, but it shows there's a record of that sin. It's the blood from that animal by the priest, not me. I don't have access. I'm not worthy to go into the presence of God. Only the priest, which is a representation of Jesus. Jesus is both the victim and the priest ministering his own blood in the true sanctuary in heaven. And, and most people don't, don't realize that, but it's actually a very, very important work. But the blood represents a record of my sin that I told a lie about Frank or, I, or what was the other thing I did wrong? I've, I've already forgotten. And so that record, by the blood of the offering, when it's brought in here to the sanctuary, it brings that record in of what I did, and that record remains there all through the year until the Day of Atonement. That one day in which the high priest would go in and make a final cleansing or atonement for the whole sanctuary. And it talks about in Leviticus 16, that whole experience. If you want to read a, an exciting chapter, Leviticus 16 is certainly one to, to do that. But um, Anyway, I need, I need to move on. I'm, I'm th okay, questions. Okay, all right, Carmelita. So when the scripture says that when we confess our sins, then he's able to forgive us. Yes. And that he takes them away from us as far as the east is from the west. Yes, Psalm 103. Okay, now I'm going to skip down just for the, for the, because that was such a good question. And we're going to go to, um, if you're looking at, I'm looking, okay, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Go down 8 lines to where it says Isaiah 43, 25 and Acts 3, 19. Isaiah 43, verse 25. And these verses answer Carmelita's question because it is a very good question. Notice what it says, Isaiah 43, 25. God is speaking. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and will not remember thy sins. Yes. Now notice the next verse here where Peter, on the day of Pentecost, tells us when that happens. This is a key point. When that happens, Acts 3.19, uh, it says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And you can see the note there. The cleansing of the sanctuary involves a work of blotting out of the record of sins. And there's another verse. Let me see if I have that on here. I don't have it. Um, write down also in that section. I don't have it. I can't believe I didn't put that down there. Acts 17.31. Let me tell you what Acts 17.31 says. Paul is speaking on the Areopagus in Athens. And is speaking to all the, the Greek philosophers and scholars and he's speaking about, the, about, about God. And he says uh, in verse 30, I'll read the verse before, Acts chapter 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now verse 31, which is the verse you want to see. It says, for he hath, God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, even Jesus Christ the righteous. So what he's saying is that God has appointed or chosen a day in which he will judge the world. And the day that he chose, that is a reference to the cleansing of the sanctuary in 1844. And Paul, when he said that back here in the New Testament, 
He says, God hath appointed a day yet in the future. And it's the same idea when Peter, at the day of Pentecost, says, um, and that's going to be in AD 31, that's going to be just after Jesus was crucified, but when he said, repent and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And the, the idea of the blotting out of sins is something that we find in the service of the sanctuary. This whole service, that makes no sense when you talk about blotting out sins. Well, what does that mean? I thought I was forgiven. You are forgiven, but there is a record, according to the pattern that God has given, there's a record of that sin that stays on record until this time of final cleansing. And only then, when there's a close examination, are those who are, the, the lives and character, oh, I'm going to put myself in the hot seat. I, I'm gonna, I, my, my life, and sit, my name, so, so what's happening here? On the Day of Atonement since 1844, there are the names in the Book of Life. Anyone who's ever claimed Jesus' name, you have your name enrolled or registered in the Book of Life. This person, they claim Jesus as their Savior, their name is in the Book of Life. So my name, Brian Hyman, comes up, and so here it is, it's in the Book of Life. Now there's going to be an examination of the Books of Record of all of my sins and the Book of Remembrance, hopefully there'll be more, of all the things that I have done according to what God has wanted me to do, the good deeds, the good things. Obviously, I can't do any good deeds. It's only with Him working through me. But if I've done anything and allowed Him to work through me to do something good, there's an examination. And when they look through the records, if, if there are sins on my account that I did and I never repented and I never confessed them and I never asked for God, then those sins will cause my name, we'll go back to the other book in the book of life, my name will then be blotted out of the book of life. But if you come over and you look and see, here's all the record of my sins, and all of them I have genuinely said, I'm sorry, Lord, I genuinely am sorry, and I'm repenting of that. Then the, the sins are blotted out, and the record of the sins are blotted out, and my name stays in the book of life. Do, do you follow that? I know it's a lot of complexity, but this is in fact the whole picture that we get from the sanctuary in the Old Testament, that there are records. So what's happening right now is that either sins are being blotted out, Praise the Lord, or names are being blotted out. And we saw, according to 1 Peter 4, 17, it's just the righteous who are being examined. The wicked are not even under, they're not even under, they're, they're, they never even claim God. They have no access or interest. They just keep their sins. I mean, if we never, it all come to Jesus, because the whole, remember the whole transference of putting my hand on the victim, representing that there's a substitute that takes the place of the sinner, and that lamb ultimately just points to Jesus. Remember John 1, 29, where John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, because he would take it on himself. But, okay, yes, another question. So you hear of sins of omission and sins of commission. So sins that you know you do are that you don't repent and commission. Good question. Okay, so here we have, um, and, and here's how good God is. And I think we'll go back to that verse that I referred to earlier. A sin is a sin no matter what the situation but sins of ignorance that I did not know and I was not aware that I did something wrong, Jesus bears them himself. That's so good. God. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at, describing the idolatry and the heathen wicked uh, of the, the, in the Old Testament who did not have a clear picture of God. But he does say, but now God commands everyone all, everywhere to repent because he sent Jesus and he expects people to look and see what Jesus has provided at such an infinite cost the, the, for our salvation. But does that make sense? that you are only responsible for the sins you know about. I mean, and so you're not responsible. That's how good God is. I can show you an example of that in, uh, let's take, we're, we're doing it, we're getting off a little bit, but let's go to John chapter 9 uh, for just a second on that point so that you're not thinking that I've made up something. Because if I don't see it in the Bible, I don't believe it. I hope you're not impressed by, by other people's opinions because opinions are a dime a dozen, but God's word is what really matters. That's what we really want to look at. Okay, um, um, okay. It's, it's the last part here with the blind man. And this is actually not as good as I... There's another place. John chapter 9, uh, verse 36. The, the man who had been born blind and Jesus uh, gives him sight and then all the, the Pharisees and stuff were mad that he had healed him on the Sabbath. Verse 36, he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This is the blind man. And, and Jesus said, uh, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and they which see might be made blind. That seems like a curious statement, but notice what verse 40 and 41 say. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words, 
and said unto him, Are we blind also? Now watch what Jesus says. Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should what? Now blindness is a metaphor or picture. He's not talking about physical blindness, even though he just healed a physically blind man. He's talking about spiritual blindness. If you did not see and comprehend what, what truth is, he said you would not have sin. So Jesus is so gracious and forgiving. A sin is still a sin, and Jesus bears the cost of that sin himself and shoulders it himself. But when there is light that comes and truth that comes, and I choose to turn away from it, which is what the Pharisees did, then he could, what does he say after that? Um, and he should have no sin. But now he say, we see. The Pharisees claim to see and understand spiritually and discern what truth and, and what righteousness was. And because they claim to say that we see, but rejected Jesus who was the Messiah, he says, therefore your sin remaineth. You are guilty of rejecting the Messiah because you claim to have light, but you're not following what the light and the truth says. But he says, if you were really blind and you did not see this, you would not have sin. And so if you were ignorant, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. There's still a, I mean, there's still a cost for the sin, but the guilt of the sin is borne by Jesus himself. So, and I've really gotten away from Sorry. what I was... No, 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 no. These are all good questions. So, uh, Kim, did you have a, a question a second ago? Okay, okay, all right. Another... Do you have a question? No, I was just going to say, when you were talking about the blotting out, that Moses actually referenced that in the Old Testament where he says, Lord, blot my name out. That's right at the very top of here. The reference is Exodus 25, verse 40, where Moses is actually interceding. And Moses is an example or a type of Christ in the sense of that he interceded for God's people, and when God was angry with them for, for their disobedience, Moses said, no, 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 Lord, don't, don't be angry with them. Blot my name out of your book. And then in the very next verse, and I don't think I have that on there, but God says, "Whoever, I'm not going to blot your name out, but whoever commits sin, those are the ones that I would blot their name out of the book. So in the book of life, you have names, and the books of records, you just have an account of everything. And when I say everything... Uh, you can see that on, uh, where is that? Okay, good. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you come down six lines where it says 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Look at the verse right below that, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. For God shall bring what? Every work into judgment with what? I mean, is there anything we can keep secret from God, whether it be good or whether it be evil? And you could also put down, and I, I, this is not exhaustive. I'm thinking of more verses I'm talking to. Put down beside that Hebrews 4.13, uh, which says, it's right after the verse which you do know, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It says, um, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Speaking of God. How many things are naked and open? It means there's everything. He sees it all, all things. And so, I mean, there's, I can't hide anything from God. None of us can. No matter how dark it is at night or if I'm in a closet or far away, if I'm in the ocean, up on a mountain, in air, it does not matter. I mean, God can see all things. And so the idea that I'm going to hide something from Him is really, biblically speaking, is, is just silly. So... Um, anyway, you have this sheet here, and I hope it'll be a nice reference, and we're going to look at some of the rest of Daniel chapter 10 and see how we can do it. It's not a long chapter. It's fairly straightforward. If you have more questions, please, let's, let's talk some more afterwards. But I want to at least see if we can go through this because Daniel 11 next week is 45 verses. And it's a huge chapter. And so I'm going to struggle to get through that next week because it's such a big chapter. But Daniel 10 verse 1, if you have your Bible, and let's see what we can find out. I'm in John. I'm not even the right testament of the Bible. Uh, Daniel chapter 10. All right. If you memorize Bible verses, you can talk faster. Here we go. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. It says, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So how much time has elapsed between this and, and chapter 9? Uh, about two years or so. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called what? That was, that was still given to him like 70 years before when he was first taken away captive by Nebuchadnezzar. Many, many years earlier. Belteshazzar. And the thing was... True, but the time appointed was, does Daniel grasp the concept of the year-day principle that 2,300 days is not just five or six years, literal years? The time appointed is long. Does he grasp the idea that this is 
2,300 years is a long time. Five or six years is not, is not as long at all. So what I'm, what I'm just trying to point out is that in the internal evidence, Daniel is giving, and he got the length and the long longevity of this long prophecy in Daniel chapter 8 and 9, which were connected right before this. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. All right, so the just for uh, reference up here, the third year of Cyrus is, and I'm just a, a, a timeline history nerd, about 535 B.C. Uh, this is about three years after uh, Cyrus had conquered Babylon in 539 B.C. and had taken it under uh, King Belshazzar. All right, verses 2 and 3. Here's where we get our whole principle that we just had for, for this since, when did we start the Daniel fast? Was that in February or January? It was in January. And you guys have come around that long? How awesome. Those of you who have been coming. I mean, I want you to know I am just praising the Lord for your interest in learning physical things. I mean, this is invaluable information. And as Daniel understood the importance of what he ate and drank physically, that it would have a direct impact on his mind and his thinking, to be able to understand the deep prophecies that God is giving to him, Look, look what he does here. He does the Daniel fast. He's like, oh, he did. What, we, what we do, or what we tried, what we did here uh, months ago. It says in verse 2, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning how long? Now, he doesn't say why, but we're going to get a clue as to why, because of, remember what we know, remember we know what year it is? We know what year it is. That's a clue. And also, uh, an angel comes to him and, and says a comment that gives us an idea of why he would be mourning. So, Internal evidence. Now watch verse 3. Here's the basis for the Daniel fast. I ate no what? Different, I'm hearing different versions out there. It sounds like the Tower of Babel. Uh, I ate no pleasant bread. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now we didn't tell people they couldn't take a shower during the Daniel fast. But in, you have to understand anointing yourself with oils. When you're in a hot area that is arid and dry, it was a way of keeping your skin from cracking and peeling. But Daniel just says, I, I even forego or, or did not do this luxury during this time because I was in such intense mourning uh, to, and really he's mourning because he wants to understand the Word of God. And he's such an example for all of us. And I think, have I literally cried and mourned and, and really earnestly pleaded with God to know better and more clearly the truth that he has uh, given to us, and I've got some work to do. I have some work to do. Now, this is incredible. Watch what happens now in verses uh, 4 through 6. A after he has had this for three weeks, keep that, keep that time frame in mind. It's going to come up again, three weeks. Verse 4, And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, and some translations would say the Tigris, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in what? Yes. Clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of... And it's still un, unclear, if you, I've, I, I've studied this, so where this location is, the gold of Uphaz. Where is this actually at? It's only mentioned one other time in the Bible, and no, one, no modern scholars know where is this location. But they must have been known for their very fine quality of gold. And it describes this man who was in linen. Now watch verse 6. His body was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of what? Lightning. Lightning and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, I don't have time to, to compare, but maybe I do. I'm going to try to do it anyway. If you go to Revelation chapter 1 for just a second. And we're, we'll obviously we'll look at this in just a few weeks. But Revelation chapter 1, there is a description of someone that appeared before John that is almost identical. And in Revelation, it's clear who it is. I think it's clear who it is in Daniel, but maybe it's because I know Revelation. Does that make sense? You always let the Bible compare itself and explain itself. That's always the fundamental principle is you let the Bible in one place define and explain what it means in other places. Revelation chapter 1, uh, looking at uh, verse... 13, uh, where it says, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the path with a what? Golden. golden girdle. Is that the same as what we saw in the gold of linen there in, in Daniel's 10? His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were what? Flames of fire. Is that similar? Yes. Um, 
Then it says, verse 15, and his feet like a defined brass. Is that similar? Yeah. Yes, it is. As if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of what? Many, Many waters. Is that similar? Yes, it is. Well, in Revelation, it's very clear because it actually says that it's Jesus who appears before John. And so if we go back to Daniel 10, knowing what it says in Revelation chapter 1, this is none other than a personage of Jesus Christ who has now come himself to give this fourth and final vision to Daniel. Are you interested or excited at all? What would Jesus himself see as so important to come and give to Daniel? And Daniel, remember at this time, uh, we know that he was about 18 years old when he was taken into captivity. So add 70 to that, the 70 years of captivity. He is about 88 years of age. Can anyone relate to that? Yeah. <laughs> Don't depress. 88 years of age. At that age, and it's interesting that John was about 90 when he saw Jesus there on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1. So God still has much mighty work and messages, especially for our more experienced and, and veteran uh, Christians and followers. So, so anyway, this is the picture in Revelation chapter 1, and this is just some artist's drawing of Daniel chapter 10, and it's the same. It is Jesus who has come to give a message to Daniel about what we don't just know yet, but it's, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's about the latter days. Daniel is now wanting to know, what is this business about far to the future and the cleansing of the sanctuary, which I just was talking to you about. Daniel did not have the privilege in his day to understand all of what was going to happen like we do, because we can look back and see the history. It had not yet happened for Daniel, and so he doesn't know all of the, the exact details that the earthly sanctuary was going to be destroyed, and that it's actually pointing to the sanctuary in heaven. So, anyway, continuing on, what is Jesus going to say? Notice what Daniel's reaction is when he's in the presence of Jesus. And it's a powerful picture of when you come to the presence of, of God, is it time to party or is it time to, be, to, to bow down and, and humble yourself and say, Lord, please uh, have mercy on me, a sinner. All right, so looking at verses 7 through 9, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they did what? You know, and we have to be, you know, Daniel is an example of true <coughs> sanctification, of true commitment and self-humility and surrender before God. And he was the only one who could see this vision. And any of the other ones that were around him were so par paranoid and terrified, they just ran away. And he says, verse 8, Therefore I was left alone and saw this what? So what I want you to notice is Jesus is going to give Daniel the vision here in verse 8. Daniel sees the vision in, in verse 8, but Gabriel is going to explain the vision in chapter 11. So we'll have to wait till next week. But I want you to notice when Daniel says, I saw this great vision, he is describing the vision that Jesus gives him of what's going to happen and take place in the latter days, which is what we're going to find he was, he was interested in and wanting to know about. And it says, this great vision, and there remained no strength in me. So keep that in mind, because we're going to talk about the gift of prophecy later on in Revelation. When a true prophet experiences a vision, what is something that happens to them? They have extra strength. What does Daniel say? I had no strength in me. For my comeliness, or my countenance, uh, was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. When a true prophet is in vision, they are completely... Of in a position of just being in no strength. That is a, the position that we see that Daniel was in. And then verse 9, it says, Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. So can prophets have visions while they're sleeping? <clears throat> That's probably an obvious answer. The answer is yes, but they have no strength, and we're also going to find that they don't breathe while they're in vision. They're not breathing, they don't have strength, and they are in a position of, of humility before God. So those are just some, some characteristics that we see in Daniel. And notice now who is going to uh, come and, and touch Daniel. Verse 10, it says, And behold, and hand touched me, which set me up upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, verse 11, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I what? Am I now sent? And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Now it doesn't say it in the text, but I am 100% inclined to believe and am very confident that that is the angel Gabriel. Gabriel was mentioned by name in Daniel 8. 
Gabriel is mentioned by name in chapter 9, and I am convinced, based on the evidence, and the, the way that, Daniel, uh, that Gabriel addresses Daniel in chapter 11 is the same way that he addresses him in chapter 9. The same way, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, I am now sent unto thee. And so Gabriel, this angel, that's the highest angel in heaven that we know of, uh, was sent to give this message of explanation to, uh, to Daniel. Uh, then in verse 12, let's move on to 12 and 13. These are actually some key verses here. 12 and 13. Then said he unto me, this is the angel Gabriel, or the angel, if you want to just leave it a generic, it is an angel. The angel said unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the, what does it say? First day, First day that thou didst set thine heart to what? Understand. Oh, there's a clue. So it says, you set your heart to understand, and so... What is it that Daniel is mourning for? He's mourning over understanding of what God has given in his word and the prophetic message that God has given. So does, it, does that make sense that we don't, it doesn't say why Daniel is mourning, but when the angel says, because you wanted to understand, from you set your heart to understanding, I'm now sent to give you the understanding that you were wanting. We can reason that Daniel was wanting understanding and mourning and went through the Daniel fast because he wanted to know and understand more clearly what's going to happen in the latter days. Verse 14, but we have a couple more verses here. The, these verses right here are, are huge. In verses 12 and particularly verse 13, we're going to see behind the scenes a spiritual battle going on to actually influence the king of Persia, King Cyrus. You know what it says in Ephesians 6 verse 12, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we wrestle not against people. Ultimately, the battle is a supernatural battle. <clears throat> so let's continue reading, though, where it says, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand. So did God hear Daniel's prayer three weeks earlier? Because remember, it said he was praying for three weeks. The answer, of course, is yes. God did hear Daniel's prayer. But there was a delay, and verse 13 is going to tell us why there was a delay. Why would God, in Daniel 9, Daniel or Gabriel is sent to Daniel immediately. But in Daniel 10, there's a three-week, 21-day delay. And let's notice why as we keep reading. Uh, still finishing verse 11. Uh, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright for unto thee am I now... No, I'm sorry, I read, I'm reading your wrong verses, aren't I? For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to what? Chasten or humble thyself before thy God, thy words were what? Have you ever prayed and wondered if God hears your prayers? Here is a great example that even when you're not seeing or hearing an answer right away, Gabriel is saying from the first, even though it was over a period of time, God heard. He, he heard your prayers and he was listening. And the, the more that you can continue to pray, um, the more it demonstrated your confidence and trust in God. That you would not, I mean, you wonder what if Daniel would have given up praying after one week or two weeks? Would he have received the answer the way that he had pleaded for? Uh, had he not? I mean, so I'm going to apply this to myself. How many times have I stopped praying thinking that God isn't hearing or listening when God was just waiting to do something great if I would just persist in prayer? You know, there's a great parable in Luke chapter 18 in the first eight verses of the parable of the unjust judge. And the whole parable is about persistent prayer. Not because God is not willing to answer, but because it shows you really want and desire what you're praying for when you are persistent in praying. If I pray for something once or one and a half times and then quit, am I really, do I really want what I'm praying for? But if I continue to pray, continue to pray, then it demonstrates and gives evidence you really do want what you're asking and praying for God to help you with. Okay. Uh, all right, now notice verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me how long? Have you heard that anywhere else before? How long was Daniel praying? The prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now there is a variety of translations and commentaries that have a different view and opinion on this verse right here. I am inclined, and this is just the Brian Hyman version, from the context to refer to the prince of the kingdom of Persia as Satan or one of his angels. Some people apply it to um, the prince of the kingdom, which was Cambyses, who was the son of Cyrus, and some people apply it to Cyrus. And so you have three choices to choose from. That this individual, Gabriel is saying, I think Gabriel is saying this because he's an angel, and if this, there's a, 
Gabriel is working to influence Cyrus to do what God wants him to do, and the devil is trying to influence King Cyrus to do what to, to not do what God wants him to do. You might say, well, what is that all about? Well, let me explain, because we have a clue uh, in, in just a moment. Let me read the rest of the verse, and we'll go to our clue. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, I believe that's, that's Lucifer, the devil, withstood me for three weeks. So Gabriel is in spiritual warfare, and, and I'm not talking about, you know, doing like the fighting, like fist fighting, but there is a spiritual battle over one person to influence him to do right or to do wrong. But then it says... But lo, who came? Michael. And, and I believe, and I can give you guys a Bible study, we're going to have the word Michael is going to come up again uh, in Daniel chapter 12. And maybe I'll save the Bible study on Michael for chapter 12. I believe Michael, which means, the name means who is like God, I am 100% convinced is Christ. And I can explain that to you in four or five Bible verses connected together, which will make you say, aha, but I don't have time to do that now. But I'm convinced that Michael is Christ. And it, But don't get confused here. The King James says, one of the chief princes. And you might say, well, there it is. There's, there's other chief princes, so how can Jesus, Michael, be, I mean, clearly he's God. He must be separate from all of them. How many of you have a marginal reading for verse 13? Look in your mark. If you do have a marginal reading, and by the way, what does a marginal reading mean? It, it, it's in the margins because it is, and, and those of you that know more than one language, this will make more sense to you. When I took Greek in, in college, when you express something, you know, sometimes there's a word and it has more than one meaning. For example, this is just written. The word set in English has more meanings than any other English word in the, lang in the English language. It has like 187 definitions or something. So you can set the table, set yourself up for success. Set the, I mean, in other words, there's multiple meanings, but it's still the word set. But the word in the marginal reading, which is another translation for the word in the Hebrew, in this case, we're, we're the Old Testament, is the first of the chief princes. Uh, and so that is absolutely perfectly clear in my mind. That is the preferred interpretation. Jesus is the first of the princes because he is the commander of the angels. In other places, in Jude chapter 1, verse 9, it calls Michael the archangel. It doesn't mean that he's an angel. An archangel is the commander of the angels. And so Michael is the one who is the first prince in charge of all the angels. That's his position um, as the son of God. So anyway... We're having an angel discussion, but write down in your notes, if you want to, Hebrews 1.14, this is a key verse dealing with angels, and it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Angels are all ministering spirits sent forth to minister or aid or assist those who are heirs to inherit salvation. So there are both good angels and evil angels that are striving over every person on the face of the earth. Uh, in my opinion, from what the Bible teaches. And that spiritual warfare is we're actually seeing that in Daniel 10. We're actually seeing a picture behind the scenes. All right, let's continue on. Um, it says, But Michael came, and I remained there with the kings of Persia, or the king of Persia, or Cyrus. And so when Jesus came to help in this struggle over Cyrus, the battle was turned in favor of, of, of Cyrus doing the will of God. Now, what I need to mention here really quickly um, how quickly can you find the book of Ezra in the Old Testament? Ezra actually takes place, Ezra chapter 4, here is why Daniel is mourning. Here is why Michael and Gabriel are contending over, the, over King Cyrus. Ezra chapter 4, looking at just verses 4 and 5 really quickly, I meant to explain this earlier, here is the concern that Daniel has and why he's praying for help from God. In Ezra chapter 4, you might remember that Cyrus, when he became king, he made a decree to allow the, the Jews to go back home. And they started to rebuild their temple, and then there were people who came and offered to help them, and those people were called the Samaritans. And the Samaritans were actually a mixture of the old northern kingdom, ten tribes of Israel, who had been mixed with the Assyrians and other empires around them, and they had lost the purity of their faith, and they had a mixture of the true faith, but they had mixed that with heathen idol worship. The Samaritans came to the Jews and said, let us help you rebuild the temple. But because the Samaritans had not clearly an understanding of the, the true way to worship God, the Jews said, you don't have any part in, in building this temple with us, and they resisted and said, no, you can't help us. Well, being rebuffed about that, here's what the, the, the Samaritans did in Ezra chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people. This is the Samaritans, and you can see that um, 
Omai says that earlier up in the, in the chapter. The people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building, now watch verse 5 in particular, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of who? Cyrus. Cyrus, king of Persia. Is that who we just read about that was in, in verse 13 where it said that Gabriel said that the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me as, as the devil is trying to influence Cyrus to listen to these counselors to resist allowing the Jews to rebuild their temple. Michael is coming, and, or Gabriel is working and trying to help Cyrus to fulfill, allowing them to restore and rebuild their, their, their temple again and to have the sanctuary rebuilt. That's a huge piece. It's a huge thing there. So anyway, that's just you could tuck that away as why Daniel is mourning and why there's a struggle over Cyrus. And Cyrus is actually wavering on whether or not because of these counselors that are hired to say, these Jews are troublemakers. These Jews are terrible. They're, they're going to be a problem. Don't let them do this. Don't let them do this. And so he's wavering in what he had initially let them do. And so the Samaritans are stirring all this up to prevent them from restoring. Anyway, that's just backstory, backstory. Let's see if we can finish. And I'll stop talking so fast. Daniel 10, verse 14. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people when. That's the time we're living in, brothers and sisters. In the latter days, for yet the vision is what? For many days. So this is not just some old vision in the past that has no rel relative bearing today. It is full of meaning because it relates to and pertains to, according to Gabriel, it relates to the latter days. The vision is for many days. All right, verses 15 through 17. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the sim similitude of the sons of men. And by the way, just what's happening, Gabriel was in such an appearance, he was so bright that what is happening here in verse 16, where it says, And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Gabriel has now veiled his presence or his position and has taken the appearance of a man. Just like when Jesus came to this earth and his glory was so great that we couldn't behold it, he veiled his divinity and put on and, and appeared as a human being. That's what, so it's still Gabriel, but he has changed his appearance into and veiled his appearance to be like just a, a, a human, a person, so that he would not be so bright because it was so overwhelming for Gabriel to look at. And if you want to write a reference down, the devil can do this as well. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, the Bible says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Don't think it's hokey pokey. I mean, an angel can't transform their appearance. They can appear and look in a certain way. And even the devil has the capability of doing this according to the scriptures. But that's what Gabriel did. He veiled the brightness of his, his, his glory so that Daniel would be able to withstand being in his presence and be able to listen to what he's saying. All right, so that's what's happening here in verse 16. One like the similitude of the sons of men, that's Gabriel, touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? And that's kind of strange language, but he's like saying, I'm so weak and feeble. How can I even talk and, and stand in your presence? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, Neither is there what? Keep that in mind when you're in vision. A true prophet does not breathe. A true prophet does not breathe. All right, four verses and we're done. Uh, 18 and 19. Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. So this is all Gabriel trying to help strengthen Daniel to be able to receive the message that, that Jesus had given to him in the vision that he saw earlier in the same chapter. Um, verse 19. And said, O man, greatly beloved... Fear not, peace be unto thee, and I love these words. Be what? Strong. Be strong, yea, be strong. Be strong is the commission that God gives to us today. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua 1 9. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Last two verses, 20 and 21. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Remember that after Persia would fall off or fade off the scene, they would be replaced by the Greek Empire. And so just as there was spiritual warfare over the kings of Persia, so too would there be spiritual warfare over the kings of Greece. Between God and his angels, Michael, and then the devil and his angels, 
trying to influence them to do what's right or to do what's wrong. Verse 21, But I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of truth, and there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Michael your prince. We're going to see Michael in chapter 12, verse 1. But Michael is a picture and a reference to Jesus. And so really all of chapter 10 is just laying the groundwork for the beginning of of the vision, or the, it's not a, it's not actually a vision. It's a it's a it's a declaration, an explanation in chapter eleven by Gabriel of what Daniel saw in chapter ten. So, what do we see in Daniel ten? We're going to wrap this up. We see behind the scenes of the spiritual warfare between Christ and Satan, and there's some other verses that talk about this. I quoted Ephesians six twelve. First Peter five eight says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour." So spiritual warfare, we might not see it with our physical eyes, but it is in fact taking place. And even now, I believe, even here in this room, the devil is trying to distract or deceive or discourage all of us. And then there's also loyal angels trying to counterwork uh, their influence as well. Hebrews 1.14. Jesus himself appeared to Daniel to give him this important vision that we're going to see in chapter 11, the explanation of that. Um, also, the prayer of Daniel allowed Jesus to settle the struggle. When Daniel prayed, he says, I'm sent now because of your prayers. Uh, I'm the one, if because, you're, because of your prayer, I'm now able to come and give an answer and to fulfill the work that you wanted me to do because of the prayer that you gave. And so, so too today can our prayers, I, I think when we pray, you know, God can do all things, but in this understanding of the great controversy, God has restrained or limited himself because of the allowing the choice of the effects of sin, which our parents, Adam and Eve, chose. They chose sin, and the consequences of sin, we see how terrible they are. But when we pray, I believe we give God permission to do things and to work in such a way as He would not be able to do, not because He's not powerful enough, but because He has limited Himself to doing what He's asked to do. If no one's asking Him to help you know, with our families, our children, our spouses, or whatever... But, but, but when we pray, I think we give him permission to do even more than he would be able to do otherwise. I'm not limiting because he's not able to, but because of the controversy and the, the, the war between good and evil, the, uh, the whole struggle with that, I believe it gives God, when we see that in Daniel, permission to work in a greater way. All right. We also see in Daniel 10, it introduces the concept that the vision of Daniel 11, which we haven't read yet, that'll be next week, shows what happens to God's people. That is spiritual Israel. That's the picture that Daniel's going to see in chapter 11 at the end of the 2,300 days or the latter days as it's referred to in Daniel 10. The latter days is what happens at the end of the 2,300 days which gets right on down to the time we're living in today. The time of the end. And the focus there is spiritual Israel. The chapter before this was dealing with literal Israel. The Jewish nation in Daniel 9. What would happen to literal Israel after 70 weeks? You know, they, they were on probation, and they ultimately rejected the Messiah. And because of that rejection, they are no longer God's chosen favorite people. But he, God continues to have a faithful people called spiritual Israel, who are today the church, the Christian church, is what Jesus established as the quality and the character of faith of Abraham. And then finally, God is counting on you and me. Is that, does that put any pressure on you? God is counting on his last day people to, just like Daniel, to earnestly strive to understand the prophecies and to pray for God's purposes to be fulfilled. The same way, the same way that Daniel said, from the time you first set your heart to gain understanding, I am now sent to help give you the, the answer to what your question was, to understand more fully. You know, we might not have an angel sent to us, but God can flash truth into our minds and into our hearts so that it is so clear that we can say, Lord, I see it, I believe it, I want to follow it and practice it because... You have revealed this to me because it's what you want me to know and you want all of us to know. But those who are seeking earnestly are the ones, like Daniel, that will know the truth. So, uh, are there any questions?